question for you. What is the proper opening race of the season? If you're somewhat of an old Formula 1 fan like all of us on the Inside Line F1 podcast, you will truly answer the question with only one word. That is Melbourne. And that's it. We are back here for the Albert Park Grand Prix. Actually, the Melbourne Grand Prix or the Australian Grand Prix, I think they've changed the names a couple of times. But regardless, we are here at the Albert Park. And guess what, folks? Last year, 440,000 people made their way to watch a Formula 1 Grand Prix here. That's how much the circuit is loved. And unanimously, I think we can agree upon the same thing, right, Kunal? This is the proper start of the year, which is why our first event, also for the inside line club is going to happen for australia yes it is it seems like the good old days australia first race of the season australia also the first race of the race screenings that we do in mumbai in india this one's going to be at car at the social out there i'm not going to be there physically i'll i'll try and attend virtually like i always do but i know that uh, somil and f1 stats guru will definitely be there but i also love the whole timing you know that suddenly it's a sunday morning race and you're done with and you have the whole sunday to you because guys remember this is actually not a thursday friday saturday race weekend for the first time in 2024 we actually have a friday saturday sunday mm. race weekend the typical race yeah, weekend format yeah it's just your clocks and calendars now uh, just when you started to get used to a saturday race suddenly it's time to snap back in and get used to sunday but more reasons to be excited I think last year we did talk about this enough but it was a home race for an Australian driver Oscar Piastri this time we've got two of them so incredible stuff we've got Piastri and Ricardo attending their home race and there'll be tons and tons of support but the big story is to watch for four DRS zones lots of uh, chaos in the pecking order as well i mean we're still at that stage where we're learning a lot about where the teams and drivers actually still are sundar amart we you know i'll actually go back to that the point about home races because interestingly we have a string of home races coming up so i just had to pull out the schedule right now so we have australia japan china a first for joe guanyo and united mm. states italy if you want to actually consider danny rick uh, a half he, he is half dalian actually um, then you have monaco canada spain so a string of home races coming mm. up but uh, coming back to the other point yes australia is actually a very very interesting circuit for me and growing up this was obviously the the home race i mean sorry the opening race of the season for me and like you said four drs zones this is where usually the championship starts and melbourne usually has a little bit of a case of being a very um, what do you say tricky race or a chaotic race because albert park has always had a minimum of 3 dnfs always last year we had eight dnfs if you remember we had three red flags mm-hmm. the most in, most ever seen in a single grand prix so i really expect this thing i really expect things to get really chaotic and interesting this weekend wait eight dnfs and the biggest heartbreak of the entire season <laughs> carlos signs with that penalty that the fi gave him and wait on that subject as well two things to mention firstly it might just be a home race for another driver we aren't quite mentioning him enough but valtteri bottas is now technically 70% Aussie so let's just put him in there with the mullet and all the accent stuff as well <laughs> but he's 77% nicely done. Aussie sticking to nicely his 70 done. nicely done <laughs> that that daddy jokes uh, late in the hour uh, in the day in oslo time you never well that, that's never a joke that, that in some circles would get you kicked that didn't land uh, that didn't land no 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 that didn't but you said 440000 people in yeah. albert park australia my goodness that's incredible a temporary race circuit by the way 440000 is almost 80% of oslo the city where i live in the whole population is you know roughly 640 650 imagine mm. 440 turn tuning up for a race in melbourne but um, there is always a different excitement about australia it's you know somil and sundaram for me there's this whole thing about f1 wanting to race at iconic circuits don't go to some of these newer circuits but when we think of iconic circuits it pretty much they're just the ones in europe right but to me albert park and suzuka i would say are two iconic circuits outside of europe you know i still don't think any of the middle eastern circuits are iconic singapore is still very very modern for me so when i think of an iconic circuit outside of europe 
Albert Park is pretty much very high on the list. Maybe Suzuka is obviously high. I'm just wondering, right, how much time does it take for it to become iconic? Because we came to Melbourne for the first time, I suppose, in 96. We had Adelaide as the season finale in 95. And very next, the very next race was once again in Australia in 96, the season opener. And since then, Albert Park has hosted uh, races, either the, the first, second or third race. Never lower than that. Hey, isn't it, wasn't it similar in 2021 as well, where we had Saudi Arabian Grand Prix as being the second last one, and then we had the race being second. But the point being here, 30 odd years it takes. One day, one day, Bahrain will also be iconic. Until that day, let's just cherish Melbourne Park. Uh, sorry, Albert Park, Melbourne Park, I'm saying. But hey, <laughs> one more thing to cherish over there this weekend. We're going to have a demo run with two big showcase cars. For, actually, rather, rather a car and a bike. It's going to be Mick Doohan riding alongside his son, who's going to be driving an old Benetton Formula 1 car. And for those of you who don't know, Mick Doohan, multiple-time MotoGP world champion, a legend of the sport whose son currently is in Formula 2, eyeing an Alpine seat as well. So there's even more celebrations. And to add to that, we may or may not see Carlos Sainz back in that Ferrari, which for me is a big moment. Because if he does come back, that for me is the biggest celebration, more than anything else. Before, before we actually go on, Samil, for somebody like you, who's the voice of MotoGP in India, who's literally the voice of the Inside Line F1 podcast, having done over 300 episodes, you should have been at the Albert Park circuits because both your sports, MotoGP yep. and Formula One, will actually have demonstration runs this weekend. I think it's going to be pretty fun to see that. And I'm pretty sure everyone, the minute they see the car, they're like, ah, hear that engine mm-hmm. go, right? And I'm, I'm, the Duhans, uh, le- Mick is definitely very, very popular than, than Jack. Jack is reserve driver for Alpine. Probably not the best team to even be a reserve driver for. But uh, exciting demonstrations. These things always bring newer audiences, newer attention. And the fact that I think one session, they're both going to run together alongside yeah. each other. And that's going to be pretty iconic uh, for for everyone yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. There's going to be that. There's going to be 400,000 fans. There's going to be the battle of qualifying. Guys, I want to put this question to you, right? This is a really tricky one because in the last couple of races, apart from the one constant being Max Verstappen winning, there's been another constant. Verstappen P1 in qualifying, Leclerc P2 in qualifying. The third person has always been different. And when I say always, it's probably not the heaviest word to use here because we've only had two races so far. But we have had two different drivers qualifying in P3 in the last couple of races. The big question to you guys is, we know who's going to win this. Of course we do. Unless there's some sort of chaos. Who qualifies third? That seems to be the one big thing full of volatility for me. Where's your money on, Sundaram? It's a very difficult question because, like you said, it's Red Bull and Ferrari up front. You'd expect Sergio Perez to be up there. You'd expect him to be up there uh, unless his late 2023 form starts kicking in. But is science going to be 100%? That's always going to be a question mark because Albon really struggled a lot when he came back at the Singapore Grand Prix last year after uh, a surgery, uh, for, uh, the similar surgery last year as well. So that's going to be very tricky. But I think I have my money on George Russell after the Red Bulls and the Ferraris. I am actually going to put my money on Fernando what? Alonso. He has qualified that Aston Martin. Okay, he has qualified that Aston Martin out of position for those two races that we've had in Bahrain and in Saudi Arabia. But the interesting thing here, you know, you guys are, Samuel, you mentioned, we'll check, will will Carlos Sainz actually be back? We don't know. Let's wait till the official confirmation or the denial, etc. And then Sundaram pointing out that Albon was still struggling when he came back in uh, Singapore. The interesting thing here is when Albon actually came back in Singapore, there was a three-week gap between the races at that time, right? This time, there is just two weeks. Of course, we don't know the severity of how it was for both the drivers, etc. And, and, you know, that begs the question, could Oliver Behrman actually get a second shot at uh, that that Ferrari seat? And if he does, uh, could he even be better prepared than he was in, in Saudi? Because Saudi, clearly, we know what happened. And, you know, Heinz Harald Frentzen, the famous Formula One driver, actually replied to me on Twitter saying he's never driven these cars. But the fact that Oliver Behrman didn't make a single mistake, knowing that 
the whole world's eyes were on him and there was that pressure to perform and he didn't make a single mistake and that's what actually stood out for uh, friends in when it came to Behman so could Behman be in the car and if he does could he again you know do what he did you know get into Q3 which is what he missed the last time that's a very interesting point because I always felt that Liam Lawson had a very difficult debut last year at Zandvoort because it was it was raining but probably being chucked yeah. into a Ferrari ca- car that too around a track like Jeddah I think that's probably the most dangerous or the worst track to actually make your F1 debut because it's got very low, low grip it's the fastest street circuit out there and you have a competitive car like a Ferrari so that's probably the most difficult debut anyone could endure the fact that he kept it well within the walls he didn't crash he didn't make any sort of mistakes like you mentioned makes it a very good debut and in that sense he's probably going to be more prepared i think he also had a couple of private tests at fiorano between these uh, two grand prix weekends so if he's in that car he's obviously going to be better prepared and if we're going to have the first day race in in four race weekends guys we we forgot to mention that it's going to be the first day race oh yeah I think he'll be well suited, well prepared to still go on, go forward and impress. So yeah, I would look really look forward to see if uh, Oli Behman's back in the car this weekend. I'm 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 going to just add one more point. Mark Hughes, the famous Mark Hughes, also wrote to me on Twitter, and he said one of the differences. And I asked this question. Are the cars very easy to drive? And Somil, if you remember, when we did the Saudi Arabian review, we actually asked this question. Are these cars easier to drive? That was one theory we put up. The second theory was, are drivers coming better prepared with the private testing uh, that we know Oliver Behman did in Fiorano, like Sundaram pointed out? And one of the things Mark Hughes turned around and said is, this era of Formula One is seeing drivers drive roughly two seconds off the optimal lap time because they're all driving to tire stint life rather than a lap time as opposed to how it was in the earlier years where you were just driving those you know super qualifying laps as you know we've seen we've we've sort of seen uh, formula one also reliving on social media as well so that's another you know give and take but you know we'll never know we just know that oliver behman had a great debut and that's what we're going to remember even though Pretty much nobody's going to keep asking this question apart from Drive three of for us. Tire Survival. Is that a good name for a documentary? Can we float it? <laughs> no, no, no. That one. Sponsored, Sponsored by, by Pirelli. Pirelli. Indeed. But I, on that whole subject, right, a quick side note before we get down into the other more on track stuff that you should be keeping an eye on for this weekend. I just want you guys to picture what if you're Oliver Behrman right now? Where do you go? What do you do? Ferrari is clearly out of the question for at least the next couple of years. And even though the theories of, hey, Ferrari should let go of Lewis Hamilton because they've got Behrman on their hands, ostentatious is probably the, the kindest word that can be used for that. You just don't let go of Lewis Hamilton, right? It's not just about what he does in the car, which is anyway levels ahead. The marketing money is just beyond anything else that anyone else can pull off. So there's that. But what happens next? He has to do well in Formula 2, which is what Fred Vassar has very clearly openly come out and said, that he needs to do well in that championship. He said that, I know I've ruined it partially for him, but he's got to do well there. So that's one criteria. But conventional wisdom, if the teams really are looking at his talent and they really are appreciating, the ideal scenario, or at least the most logical one based on past experiences, would be Haas. What do you want to go to Haas? What's, it's, it's like such a weird position to be, right? Because... In one side of things, you can be dreaming about a Formula 1 drive and thinking you're the next Oscar Piastri. Thinking, hey, if I'm that good, do I really want to spend a few years at Haas? But it's not even tangible at the moment in time. It's such a hard place to be for the youngster, I'm thinking. So it's uh, kind of a weird time for him to just get back in and focus on Formula 2 now, Sundaram. I find it to be quite a fun scenario for him. That's 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 the dilemma. Once you've actually tasted the how these cars how quickly they how quick they can go you really don't want to come back to formula 2 and then continue with the rest of the campaign you really want to be back in that f1 car and as soon as possible so it's a good problem for him to have and that too at the age of just 18 years so it is very uncharacteristic of ferrari to actually hand an 18 year old a debut but they didn't have any option last weekend but it's going to be an interesting problem because there's no other place where he can go he has to go to haas and probably the seat in Ferrari is locked in for the next two to three years as well. But I think Ferrari are not going to make the mistake that 
Alpine did with Oscar Piastri. They're going to make sure that he has a watertight contract. He doesn't slip through their fingers and go to any other team. He's going to be at Haas most likely next year because Haas has had, I think, scheduled six practice free practice sessions for Oli this year. So they're really trying to make sure that he comes into that team next year. And I think he's going to spend a, a year or two maybe there before uh, he gets that Ferrari drive. I think it's going to be very difficult to see him elsewhere. Wait, do we know the length of his Ferrari contract, Kunal? Is there anything out there about it? No, right? No, it's it will almost never be known. And, you know, he's a junior driver, which means his contracts pretty much go endless. Uh, till saying, if you achieve ABC, we'll get you into Formula 1. And then even when we get you into Formula 1, we will try and place you either on our team or a partner team. And you literally cannot leave. And if you want to leave, you got to pay us back some of the money or a lot of the money that we've spent oh, on your career. That's pretty much how it happens. Is right? that and the case? How, do, how does that work in? Like uh, uh, from, from your time at Force India, oh, it, it has what to was be. that system like? Yeah. I, I'm yeah. genuinely curious because I hadn't heard of this before. So Oscar yeah. or rather McLaren might have paid I, it's Oscar's contract off for Alpine, right? In, in that case? That, that's the thing. In the case of Alpine, they relied on trust. They le- relied on, uh, you know, not a contract. They were hoping in the goodwill of Alpine having invested in PS3's career, things would go through. So that's a bad example okay. to take, right? But in the case of Pierre Gasly, in the case of Carlos Sainz, in the case of these two drivers who move from uh, Red Bull then to Renault, okay, there has and you know there has to be a change of exchange of money now it all depends how much red bull in this case of you know gasly and signs would ask for back in return and it makes sense right because if i am spending i'm using this as an example let's assume you're a junior driver somewhere and i'm spending millions of dollars trying to get you to formula one i am spending that money because i believe in your talent more importantly i believe in your future mm-hmm. earning potential it's your earning potential that I'm putting money on, not you scoring points, not you getting polls, right? That's, of course, what's visible. But what's not visible is how much money can Somil actually end up making. So I'm banking on what is known as future earning potential. Now, if that future earning potential is taken away from me, I'm saying I want the investment I made in your career back for me. Is that the principal amount? Is that a principal with an interest? It depends on case-to-case basis. I I really didn't know that. I really didn't know that. Something. That's interesting. We just learned something. Exactly. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you, not bad. You. Not bad. Some nuggets that you only get on the Inside Line F1 podcast. But should we should we get back to the on track stuff now, guys? Because it's been. Let's do that. Yeah. Let's uh, do that. Yeah. Temporary race circuit. I always love these temporary ones. They're in the city, but not a street circuit. Why can't we just have more temporary yeah, race Yeah, exactly. And at this temporary race circuit, it's very interesting to note that last year, Alex Albon did have a DNF, which was not very good. But he qualified eighth in a Williams. And remember, at that stage, Williams would just back off, frankly, let's just say another terrible season in 2022. So it was quite a surprise to see Alex Albon in D8. This year, I am personally very excited to see where that car stacks up because James Wells very clearly at the time of the launch said that we don't want this car to be a straight line merchant. I'm paraphrasing, but we want it to be a lot more balanced. Can we see something change in terms of the results? Will there be some shake up on where Williams are? And by the way, Logan Sargent has also been somewhat closer to Alex Albon in terms of qualifying gaps and also where he's been in the race. Williams are going to be one interesting team to watch for, according to me. I think so. And, you know, you are, you have said who will be P3. I'm going to actually spin that question further to say who will be in the top 10 in qualifying mm-hmm. on Saturday. Because in Bahrain, typically we saw the five top five teams score points. So it was, you know, Ferrari, Red Bull, Aston Martin, uh, McLaren, and did I miss someone? Mercedes, right? They scored points in the race. But in the Q3, in Q3, we saw Nico Hulkenberg slip in at the expense of Lance Stroll, right? So we had one top five member, so one of the top 10 cars, the fastest cars, actually not make it to Q3. In Saudi Arabia, at the expense of Oliver Behman, who we can, of course, pardon for not getting into Q3, Yuki Sonoda made it into qualifying. Could it be, uh, you know, Alexander Albin 
in the Williams who could now again make sure that the Williams is back in the top 10 at the Albert Park circuit. So that's something I would really be looking to score. And expanding further on this, now that I already said that the top five teams scored in the race in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, Haas became the sixth team to score a point. Will we, could we actually see a seventh team score points in 2024? And hence, could that be Williams, although Alpine is going to wish that it is them if ever they <laughs> score a point in 2024. You know, something very interesting happened last yeah. year at last year's Australian Grand Prix because of all those DNFs that happened through the race. After the end of this, after, after the end of that round, all 10 teams have scored, had scored by then. So, if we have more retirements this year, because mm. we've ha- had barely a few, we didn't see any in Bahrain, we saw just a couple in Saudi. If we have more retirements this weekend, then we can actually have more teams scoring points and Williams could be one of them. And as you rightly mentioned, Albert Park is the home of chaos anyway. We see so many safety cars happen here every single time, which spins us back on to another fun point to watch for in the race, the opening lap. Every single time you do think of Albert Park, you think of such a chaotic opening lap. 2019, Ricardo losing his front wing. I think it was 2004 when Ralf Schumacher flew off the top as well. I think we saw a couple of really crazy... I think last year it was one of the horses who cut a corner or something, right? It was some, some sort of chaos there in the last couple of years where one car cut a corner, there was a big big accident in the middle as well. Or a couple of cars getting pushed off to that right outside wall heading out of turn number one. That's also going to be crazy. That that first couple of laps are going to be... Those couple of first... Uh, what am I saying? Those first couple of laps are going to be quite fun. But generally as well, I know we're deep into this episode, but we haven't mentioned this yet. It's not the old Melbourne, which means the slow speed corners that we really like about it. I, I wouldn't say passing opportunities because they really weren't, but the corners that gave it character are sort of gone now, which means 40 RS zones, lots and lots of straights, corners where you just sort of fly past and make it a kink rather than actually slowing down, turning and making it more technical. And good for Lance Stroll, that one corner where he actually crashed in his first year is also gone. The one where he just turned right onto the lakeside, which is incredible for him as well. But do you guys like the layout now? I mean, we've had one year to see it. And after the race last year, there was so much chaos that we didn't get to talk a lot about it. But what do you guys make of it? Is it well, judging by the tone of my voice, I'm clearly not a fan. But what about you guys? Uh, what, what do you think of it, Kunal? Oh, I'm definitely not a fan. I think, if I remember correctly, it's turns 9 and 10 that they've sort of reprofiled. And that's actually taken some of the character away because one of the beauties of Albert Park that I know is you could get really up and close to the walls. Turn 10, exit, you could kiss the wall. You, The closer you get, the, the faster yeah. you can sort of be. And they've just taken that whole, you know, away. And I love the corners that follow after that, the high speed, you know, chicane that comes. But there was a lot of character to this as well. And I just don't think we always need DRS zones and we don't always need, uh, you know, high speed sections. Some of these Mickey Mouse stuff, as we call it, although turns 9 and 10 were hardly any Mickey Mouse stuff. But if you got that wrong, technically, you were under attack for that uh, you know, high-speed sequence of corners that were to come. So, you know, unfortunate that they've reprofiled it, but we just got to live with it. And you mentioned uh, opening lap. You know, I love the opening lap here because the the opening two or opening four sequence of corners are uh, turns one and two are turn, you know, right and left. And then again, three and four turn right and left. And then there's another slow speed left-hander. So what it does is it keeps the, the whole pile bunched up. And that's why we see lots of action Sometimes even lots of retirements, lots of accidents, spins, etc. In on the opening lap. And truth be told, the way Formula One, Formula One point five, and Formula One point seven five are racing in twenty twenty four, it's the opening lap and maybe the the second lap where we could see some action before everyone settles down in the others wake, gives a two second gap, waits for the TRS to be activated, and and so on. So that's why I'm really excited about that opening lap. No, for me, Sunday. I think. It's, it's quite the opposite because, um, like you said, the opening lap is very crucial. I think the opening sector is very crucial. And after the first sequence mm. of corners, like you said, there is a right-hander, there's a slow left-hander. That's where a lot of the chaos could actually happen before everyone's actually then let loose towards the high-speed sections. And probably you might not see a lot of overtakes after that. But the thing is, that section 
of turn nine and ten was probably the limiting factor as to why we didn't have a lot of overtakes over the last couple of seasons, and that's why they had to go ahead and make that move. Last year we had thirty overtakes, and that's the most that we've ever seen at Albert Park in the hybrid era. And that whole high speed section was probably one of the reasons why that was possible. Otherwise, people are always going to complain that just like Spain, just like Barcelona, we don't see enough overtakes and the race is very processional. Uh, but if that allows for more overtaking, if that allows for more battles, I would love to see that happen. And I think we did see that to some extent last year. But we, I think the pit lane here is also much more narrower than in other circuits because, like I said, it's it's a temporary circuit. So I think I have to probably recheck this. I think the pit lane speed also drops considerable dis- uh, by a considerable number here, which also means strategy could be very important. I know it's a one stopper. It's it's a typical one stopper from mediums to hards, but then okay. strategy could could be crucial over here. It's a, that's a great point. Actually, the pit lane speed limit here used to be 60 kilometers per hour for the reasons you mentioned. They upped it a couple of years ago to 80 kilometers per hour and for the very reason. So, you know, I would have loved for it to be, go back to 60 because it just brings an additional strategy element. Although, you know, a slower pit lane speed limit means you're anyway taking away the option of drivers and teams pitting more than once, uh, so to say. But uh, strategy-wise, it's not going to be the most exciting race, as you just pointed out, unless there are stoppages, red flags, safety cars, and and so on. But uh, let's see that there is somebody. Let's hope that there is somebody who challenges Max Verstappen because he could be going for his 35th pole position, three poles in a row that he could be scoring, uh, you know, Bahrain, Saudi, and Australia. Could be going for his 57th win, his second... 10 race winning streak he could equal that now the question is could he actually build that to 20 in 2024 yeah. given how he's going but why don't we just spend a few minutes because while we are understanding all the stats and how it's all playing out and for the new fans especially the ones who are a bit on the fence why don't you spend five minutes to just understand is it really easy for max to do what he's doing or is he actually being challenged what do you guys think Samuel, why don't I think he's only being challenged by himself and the limits that he has in terms of his performance. Clearly, that car is miles away. The challenge when you're that good is not to go that much faster. It's to go that much faster within the constraints of managing DNFs or technical failures, which is what they're doing right now. In Saudi Arabia, if you really look at the way he was driving and also that crucial radio message at the end, he didn't say... I mean, his, his engineer, GP, didn't say, oh, well-driven, or you were extremely fast. He said, well-managed. What does that mean? What does that tell you? At that level, when you're that good, it becomes all about managing your pace to the point where it's just able to win comfortably enough, but not that, but not push the car to the point where it could break or just end up saving an engine part because you just also want to make sure that you end up taking four engines for the entire season. That's where the next level of greatness for Max lies, which is what it is. Easy. Definitely not, but the competition is internal more than external. So that's what I that's how I look at it, to be honest. No, for me, I think it's the fact that a lot of people think it's all about a game of pace, but it's also a game of being consistent. And that's where I think Hamilton yeah. won me over during 2015, 16, 17, 18. He was so bloody consistent with that car because the car gives you a certain platform and you as a driver kind of just push it even further. But it's very, very difficult to do that consistently week in, week out through all the sessions, acing all those corners, ensuring that you don't make a single mistake. Verstappen's not made a single mistake in a very long time. And that's something that's very admirable. And sure, he's not being challenged. The performance gap is such that he's not being challenged by any other team. But if that does come to happen at some point of time, I think he will edge out the others. But he's in a very comfortable position at this point, I would say. He, the car gives him certain benefits. He's using it perfectly. And I'll just I'll just add one one layer here. And it's while it's with Stappen, it's yeah. also Red Bull Racing. They're able to hit their simulation tools so well that they come at any race circuit. And trust me, all these race circuits have different requirements from your package. 
they're able to hit the setup. They know exactly what their tires are going to be. Stint life that we mentioned at the start of the, the episode. Um, they're nailing their pit stops. I mean, despite all the performance uh, advantage they have, Red Bull is still one of the fastest teams in pit stops. They're nailing strategy. They're nailing their opening laps, their starts. There are so many things yep. that can go wrong. But they are able to nail all of that. And, and that, to me, is also one of the key highlights of this dominance that Max is showing. Consistency, error-free uh, performance from the team and the driver. And trust me, they still push on that Saturday they are still challenged. And it's not that Max is qualifying 15th or 10th or 5th and then saying, I'm going to just use my race pace. No, he is still going for the first couple of rows as he can. Because again, you know, one of those circuits where four out of the last 12 races have been won from pole. But importantly, eight out of the last 12 races have been won from the front row. So qualifying is still as important. And qualifying in these cars is still very much on the limit. And they are still being challenged in qualifying although somebody listening in here could say guys in Bahrain he was two tenths ahead in Saudi he was three tenths ahead there's a very good chance if this trend continues he's four tenths ahead in Australia so he's technically not being challenged uh, you know in qualifying at least somebody could argue that but you know he still has to be there every single lap whether it's practice qualifying or the race and he and is there. you know what's the only way to beat a team that's that good you can't have someone else beat them. They have to kill themselves internally. That's what happens. Mm. They, they kill each other. They, mm. they, they don't have anyone good enough to come and beat them. It's, it's all internal, which is what we're also getting to see. Because the latest developments are that the female employee... And, and once again, I'll just talk about the latest development in a second. I read somewhere. I, don't, I can't even trust the validity of these stupid clickbait websites. But I read somewhere that apparently Jos Verstappen is getting personal with Christian Horner about this whole affair. Because the female employee was apparently speaking to Jos Verstappen himself. Like, what the hell, dude? Like, where are we these days with reporting? I, I like this. But, but the latest developments are that... Uh, the so-called female employee is now taking the matter to the FIA, which means more escalation. It's a, it's a relatively minor thing, but all the rumors said that before Australia, Christian Horner would be dismissed. At the time of recording, he's dead. Who knows? By the time this episode goes out, we might have a new team principal. Hmm. No, no, no. One sec, one sec. Yes, I know you're just... Firstly, we can't be clickbait because this is audio. <laughs> But why, why don't we actually see the trend? In Bahrain, it was Christian Horn, uh, Horner under attack because it was yeah. the opening race of the season in the whole Red Bull scenario of things. In Saudi Arabia, it was Helmut Marco under attack, right? And and yours, sorry, and and yeah, and Max Verstappen did not come in support of Horner. He spoke of performance, 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 but he came out and he spoke in support of Marco, saying if Marco yeah. goes. I'm going because I know what Marco's done. And Marco's, of course, said this on our podcast last year in June, the only podcast he's ever been on for one whole hour where he explained how he and Dietrich started Red Bull Racing and the Red Bull Junior program several years ago in the 70s and 80s and the likes, right? But my, my point here is, in Australia, who will come under attack? Which way will this Red Bull power struggle go? Because Jos Verstappen, who was rallying himself on the weekend of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, wasn't there in the paddock. But he will be, or he should be back, I assume, in Australia. Will there be more comments? Because I don't know which way the whole power struggle is going to go. The, the reverse could also be true that Red Bull finally have had time between uh, the races to sit down and say, guys, you know what? Actually, we we built an even, strong, even stronger car without those side parts that everyone was worried of. Can we find truce here? Can we just agree on how we're going to you know, you know, move forward here? Because they want to continue. It seems crazy that Max is going to leave. Nobody would want to leave this dominant car and go. Uh, so they're going to try and do everything to make it work rather than not make it work. So let's see how the whole Red Bull thing goes. But could very well be that the biggest headlines this weekend come from Daddy Yoss, Yoss the boss. <laughs> exactly that. No competition at the top. What do we say? But last couple of points. Things to watch for in this race. Watch for how McLaren are going to be 
I think Sundaram, it's going to be fun, right? Because in Saudi Arabia, we saw that McLaren was struggling to get past the Mercedes because they had no straight line speed. But the big question up in the air is, is it a car characteristic thing? Is it a setup thing? I think in Australia, we should get more of an answer towards that, which means the volatility in the midfield will be fun to watch. And then Mercedes are also such a big question mark, aren't they? I mean, we, we haven't been able to decipher where they really are. I, I don't think they know themselves, do they? I think that's, that's a very interesting battle in itself. McLaren, Mercedes, sometimes the Aston Martins also there. Um, but McLaren have had this problem last year as well. They've really had a draggy car and that also came to the fore this time. And Saudi does have some very long straights and the effect of DRS is, is quite big over there. So it was expected, but I think they did quite well finishing in the top 10. And each each race is probably going to give us more answers to that. From what uh, it seems that they're not going to be coming up with big upgrades until the first six, seven races of the season. So there's not going to be much of a difference. But I believe McLaren did pretty well around high-speed circuits last year, Silverstone and the likes. So if they finished in the points last uh, last weekend, they could f- still have a decent outing this time out. I'm actually very curious to see where Mercedes is this weekend because it's going to probably end one of my very interesting stats because McLaren, uh, Mercedes has always been on the podium in Australia in the hybrid era. And they don't seem to have the car to put them on the podium once again. They've had a bunch of other issues cropping up. And going back to the point which Kunal mentioned as well, teams, Red Bull has been so inch perfect, even everyone in the paddock. Teams like Mercedes have been having cooling issues in Bahrain. Uh, Ferrari had brake issues in Bahrain. So despite all the manpower and all the money that goes in, they too tend to make these little mistakes. Mercedes... Adopting a new aero philosophy, they're still learning, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see how well they adapt and how quickly they learn because they've not been able to match what they see in the simulator and what they've actually been seeing on track. So it's back to square one and trying to understand the car for them once again. <laughs> and and you spoke very interestingly of updates, Sundaram, and one of the things is Typically, teams would not bring upgrades to a flyaway race because it's expensive. You have to, you know, bring them in via air freight and so on. But now we've got, you know, Australia, Japan, China, all of them flyaway races. So will team will teams actually bring upgrades or will they stay away from them? But upgrades is not the only way to extract performance. Like Ferrari keeps saying, we just need to extract more from our package. We need to just hit the setup windows much better. Teams would have had two races and then a two-week gap to the third race. I expect that they would have had more time to try and find uh, performance in their existing packages in itself. So that's something I'm looking forward to. Will the pecking order change? Because why don't we just actually see the pecking order is Max Verstappen, right? Then Checo Perez. There's a bit of a gap. I'm talking of the race. Then there's Ferrari. So that's pretty much set in the top three. Right. Then there is either Aston Martin, McLaren or Mercedes or McLaren, Aston Martin, Mercedes, depending on how you see it. But a lot of that is just track position built. It's down to if you have track position, you will more or less be ahead of your competition. And it's also down to this whole thing about, uh, you know, the inability to follow is coming back, given how these regulations are now in the third year and the, the teams have sort of develop their aero platforms a lot more in fact james allison and we could probably do this another day because we are also getting close to the 40 minute mark but james allison just a couple of days ago said that fi was wrong in chasing dirty air and reducing it and he was of course saying this in reference to the fact that um, you know teams are going back to seeing that it's difficult to follow cars right but that's pretty much your top five that you got and then somewhere on around is either the racing bulls or the williams and then towards the, the bottom of all of this i think comes kick sauber or whatever you mm-hmm. call them and so on so that's the, the pecking order will a new circuit will this gap will will when i say new as in in terms of characteristics change this pecking order and that's what we'll know from australia yep so many fun things to watch Now that we're looking ahead in the future, let's end this episode with a look back in the past. Guys, one memory each from Melbourne. We mentioned that it's the home of Formula One for all of us. Where do we begin with this one? I am going to go for a really goofy memory because it's all fun and games to say, hey, Sebastian Vettel won here, Akimi Raikkonen did. 
I remember the time in 2011 when Adrian Sutil actually opened up the DRS at a corner. Remember, first year ever of the DRS's application. At that time, uh, you you couldn't quite it wasn't quite as uh, efficient as the modern day systems that you could just break and it'll just shut down and then Sutil heading into a corner, press the DRS button. Kunal you'll be able to expand more on it because you were there in the team at that point in time. and then spun it round and everyone at that point at least looking from the outside was confused about what's happened here as he put in too much throttle what's happened here turns out it was the stupid devilish wing and we still have a problem with it today <laughs> yeah yeah i i so re- i know exactly what you're talking of it was last corner and again it's a beautiful s that you come out of a left right and the right co- right corner starts with the the main straight and it's a shortest main straight goes up and comes down and then you just flick the drs wing open and he opened that drs wing a little too soon lost all that rear end down force slammed it in spun around blah 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 and that's what happened but sundar what about you what's your favorite australian gp memory what's the one that comes to your mind it's difficult to call it favorite huh? by the way but before that kunal mentioned kimi raikkonen winning in 2013 around albert park that's actually the last time a team apart from ferrari mercedes or red bull won around a street circuit or a temporary circuit so it's been 11 years since we've seen a different team apart from the top 3 win at a street venue not my favorite memory but the fact is that i'm grateful fernando alonso is still racing still performing at the highest levels and melbourne does takes me back to take me back to 2016 when he rammed into esteban gutierrez flipped over did a couple of somersaults and still managed to come out unscathed and still continues to contribute to formula 1 and uh, delights all of us so 2016 Australia a very horrific crash but good to see that he's still performing at the highest level and what a rough couple of years it must have been huh 2015 that first accident where he forgot oh, he was. a lot <laughs> and <laughs> oh hey that's the start of a new fernando hey that's where the rookie driver actually started yes. to come in i was thinking what was yesterday that's when it all started that's when his rebirth <laughs> happened <laughs> Rebirth happened exactly. Oh yeah, you're right because I remember 2014 is getting all tired and yes. stuff. Ah, we have nailed it. We have nailed it. But okay, prediction times. Uh, prediction times. Time. Where do you think Alonso finishes? Let's not go for the conventional ones because uh, no need to guess who's P1. P2. Uh, let's not go for an order bit. Let's go for more specific questions. Sergio Perez. Do you think he'll be second? Yes or no? In a word. No. I think he will be. Who will be second? Butler. <laughs> okay. Who is the last car to qualify in the top ten, apart from the usual suspects? I say Alex Albon. Yuki Tsunoda. <laughs> Yuki Tsunoda. Not bad. Not bad. Oh wait, we could have said. We could have said Lance Stroll as well. That would have been an unusual suspect too, in a way, technically. But folks, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Inside Line F1 podcast. We'll be back with more, including the Australian GP race review. And yes, if you are in Mumbai, I will genuinely be annoyed if you don't come to watch the race with us. Because if you're at that stage of the episode, clearly it means that you love listening to us, and we would absolutely love the opportunity to discuss the race with you after it ends as well. So join us at Car Social, and the link to the tickets will be live on our social media in a couple of days' time. So keep tracking over there. Take care, folks. Bye bye.